Hey there, Hetty here. Way back when I started penning this blurb, Benable Wen had recently posted a thoughtful video on the topic of authenticity. I've linked it in the description for those of you who haven't seen it. It has been a while. <laughs> While watching it, I found myself thinking that one of the problems with identifying our own authentic selves is that many of us are pretty bad at evaluating our own expertise. We grant ourselves a level of authority about ourselves that, frankly, is probably exaggerated, in part because we like ourselves and prefer to think well of people we like, including our own egos. I think we sometimes misuse that authority to declare that we harbor strengths that, in actuality, we don't really, or that we are above feelings that, honestly, we very much feel. It's the same sort of overconfidence people harbor toward claimed but unverified authorities in academic fields, of which I am frankly one, given that you all have no recourse but to take my word for it when I say I'm credentialed in this area or that. Only this time, the field of study is ourself. The difference being that in the case of ourselves, there really aren't very many people out there who could hope to convincingly challenge our interpretations, or otherwise prove that we're talking out of our asses when we spout about our true selves. We are each, however unqualified, the world's leading expert on ourselves. There is a difference, though, in being the expert of our own perceptions and desires, which we almost certainly are, and being expert in the ways in which we are influenced by those perceptions and desires. And so I submit that we should each allow for the very real possibility that even when we put our best efforts toward identifying our authentic selves, we'll turn out to be wrong a decent proportion of the time. One of the most obvious and well-documented ways this tends to manifest is that in wanting to think well of ourselves, we convince ourselves that we share those virtues that we find inspiring in others. In the spiritual community, I think many of these virtues are prescribed reflections of what has become one of the most popular generic witchy personas that pop up in my suggested videos section. These are the traits that are so frequently touted that they end up seeming like universal ideals, although they're often just a caricature. These tropes include being diehard nature lovers, being unflaggingly environmentally conscious, being anti-GMO, being passionate about injustice, although often not about politics, being healers, being nurturers, being unjudgmental, being fundamentally disapproving of negativity, being in the 95th percentile of empathy, being of calm disposition in the face of unrelenting douchebaggery, being absolutely opposed to certain forms of spellcraft, being absolutely supportive of other forms of spellcraft, and so on forever. And yet, the reality is that even if these are a reflection of many people's aspirations, are they really embodied by most of the individuals who gauge themselves to possess them? This isn't an accusation that anyone is lying or pretending. Neither of those is required. A person might just be wrong, mistaken in their evaluation of themselves. They might aspire to be something that they haven't yet achieved, or alternately, they might want to aspire to be something they think they ought to aspire to. I'm sure most of us can pick out a number of the things I listed that we think are true about us, and a number more that we wish were true, and which may one day if we work toward them. But for many of us, embracing all of these would be entirely inauthentic, and working toward them all would be just working against ourselves. Picking and choosing which aspirational goals we want to pursue, whittling down the list of ideal traits as each of us perceives them, is probably the more authentic act. And the harder act that is prone to fail, because it requires a fairly expert understanding of ourselves to get right, rather than a superficial understanding of what we feel like we should feel. Embracing the realization that I just don't have the capacity to give a shit about everything was supposed to be a bitter pill to swallow, but frankly, it goes down like honey every time I remember to take it. One might argue that it does so because, you know, it lets me off the hook of self-improvement. But I disagree. I think it helps focus that improvement and grants me the right to acknowledge the inarguable fact that I can't do it all, and trying is equal parts foolish and unhealthy. It also acknowledges that authentic me doesn't actually want to do it all. It just sometimes wants to want that. 
Other times it's delighted to embrace those aspects of myself that others see as flaws, even when those others may be right about that. It can certainly leave one feeling like an asshole when you actively disagree with what you perceive to be the mores and more importantly, actualized traits of the people you think of as members of your community. And if you've ever thought that about me, Firstly, thanks, that's flattering, although I hope you realize it's only because I have control over what you hear from me, and I try to put my best foot forward. And even then, this is as charming as it gets. Like, appreciate that for a second. But secondly, fret not, for the rest of this video is dedicated to revealing and reveling in a small selection of the various ways authentic me is liable to draw your disapproval or shatter your image of me. Consider it my nod to the hue and cry for authenticity. First up, because it colors so very many vices and flaws, I am judgmental. For instance, I don't believe for a second that people who claim not to be are right when they say they don't judge, and I think they should, as a rule, stop using absolute statements so much. I think there are things it's very good to be judgmental about, like the ideology of hate groups, and things it's bad to be judgmental about, like the educational choices of young adults. I think sometimes I fuck up in my initial estimation of which category a topic falls under, and so sometimes have to revise my opinion. I think failing to change one's opinion is a sign that you're bad at thinking about things. I also think it's smart to take a soft, judgmental stance about a lot of things, which isn't necessarily synonymous with questioning or voicing support for the potential faults or benefits of that thing. I also consider it worthwhile to opt into the suspension of judgment, and fairly frequently at that. There are topics about which I expect to suspend judgment on until the day I croak, either because I doubt I'll ever have enough understanding to reach a thoughtful conclusion, or because I don't care enough about the topic to wade into the field of study so as to form an educated opinion. I can, however, also be unrelenting and unmerciful in my judgments. Next up, I don't really know where I stand on the ethics of curses. I'm told I'm supposed to have an opinion about them as a whole, but I kind of don't, and it's been a while, which leads me to suspect that this may be one of those things I'm never truly sure about. I do like a good curse, though, and have on rare occasions been moved to cast one. But I don't consider all curses equally nasty either, just as I don't think drinking a beer on the sidewalk occupies the same realm of bad behavior as does arson. I have no compunction about working spells designed to call somebody to justice who might otherwise not be, and I have absolutely cast them out of more than some stoic desire for balancing the scales. Sometimes I cast them for the sole reason of Fuck that guy. Oh gods, how I wish the people in his life knew about this and could revile him to his face. And I'm frankly okay with feeling that way from time to time and acting on that feeling from time to time too. In part, that's because a fair few truly awful people otherwise get away with atrocious shit. And a right hard slap across the face has a chance, however small, of getting them to knock it the hell off for a while. Non-malicious spells that incorporate the manipulation of others is another thing I don't fundamentally take issue with, although I've found that I'm weirdly discerning about what I feel comfortable doing and not sure if there's a rationale behind it that's solid. For example, I really dislike, just from a gut level, the idea of even trying to cast a spell that would interfere with somebody's voting decision. But if a friend's promotion relies on the silence of a dude who doesn't like how tight her shirt is, I'm okay with giving my all to woo-wooing him out of the office on review day. My instinct is to believe that if subjective bias is sufficient to grant one the right to interfere with another's life in mundane ways, it grants me the right to attempt to neutralize those biases. But like I said, that's an instinct. It's not a reasoned conclusion. And so... I'm not sure whether any of these are defensible acts, ethically speaking. I'm not sure in part because my thoughts on the topic sort of pivot around the question of whether one believes that their spellcraft changes only themselves or that it can alter the world around them. 
If it's the former, then pretty much anything is fine. There is an argument to be made that the casting of curses could be personally unhealthy if it becomes a habit, but it isn't like directly and immediately harmful to others. If one believes even a little bit that spellcraft can shape the outside world, even a little bit, then the act becomes ethically problematic. The scientist in me will likely always doubt that I've had a hand in shaping external events, but even that doubt can never amount to certainty. The witch in me takes the position of, screw it, I'm trying anyway, and she does so because, for whatever reason, it often works out the way I'm hoping it will. Anyway, my waffling notions on all of this are already too long to include here, and we could talk all day about confirmation biases, but suffice it to say that I am at times one of those bad witches your mom warned you about, but for all that either I or you can prove, only in that I shake my fist angrily at the sky and then, at some point thereafter, somebody else blows a tire on their way to work. Number three. What do you think I look like? You probably have a mental image of me. I bet that image is much prettier by conventional standards than the reality, and so thank you. It probably also dresses better. Don't let the loveliness of the pictures I use as backgrounds fool you, though. I care a lot more about the aesthetics of my items and tools than I do my own. I'm also generally quite happy with how I look, which isn't to say I never have those days, but they're infrequent exceptions and generally revolve around the judgment of other people whose opinions shouldn't matter. As I age, though, I take more and more comfort in the knowledge that even if a British sitcom would cast me in a role, Hollywood would never. I feel it's important to mention so as to drive home the fact that none of my best features are lessened by the fact that you might not want to nail me if ever we met. Finally, I'm terrible at following through when it comes to my videos. You may have noticed. I should really stop telling people, that's a great idea. I'll try to put something on that topic together over the next few weeks. Because I frequently realize, after the fact, one of two things. Either I only have enough to say to fill a couple of minutes, which clashes with a strong preference I have for producing videos I feel have something substantive to say that hasn't already been said a hundred times before. Or, alternately and more commonly, I realize that I have so much to say that I'll end up having to make like three 20 minute videos on the thing in order to get out the bare minimum of what I want to convey. And the problem with that is that the only way for me to muster the will to follow through is for all that extra work to be something that will feed me at least twice as much as a video that requires one third the effort would. Experience has taught me that the overwhelming majority of people who watch my videos just aren't going to follow me on an hour-long journey, so I can't rely on finding motivation in the notion that a sizable chunk of people may get something out of it. The disconnect between effort expended and watch time for multi-video series is so stark when it comes to my stuff that it's often a negative correlation. The more nuanced, robust, and interesting a concept is to me, the less anybody else cares to hear it. Which, I'm pretty sure, is a sign that I'm right and the rest of you have terrible taste. <laughs> but really, what this means speaks directly to the question of authenticity. Being true to my own interests does not ensure popularity, income, what income, positive reinforcement, what have you, and it certainly won't maximize any of those. There are all sorts of good reasons for catering to an audience, to friends, to family. But there are a lot of reasons not to as well. Reasons to defy others' desires or the promise of praise. If this channel is going to remain or become even better at what it is, a testament to my passions and massive ego, I have to try to figure out what authentic me is best served by. I'm only guessing at what that is, of course, but it sure as hell doesn't include the flawless execution of all witchy mores, or the ability to provide insight on all witchy realms. It shouldn't include your belief that I execute those mores perfectly either. I dare say the same holds true for you, and frankly, I don't think that's anything for a witch to be ashamed of. And on that note, I'll bid you a lovely day.